for real. So we're going to continue to look at alkene reactivity. Ideally, I don't have to talk over you. Uh, so you've got the Chapter 4 homework up there. In theory, you're already done with the Chapter 4 homework. We're moving into Chapter 5. Uh, you should have started, at very least, some of Chapter 5's homework. Um, hopefully, you're getting quite a ways through that. In theory, we'll finish up chapter or chapter five in the last little bar part of chapter eight uh, this week, and ideally, we'll actually be starting chapter nine on Thursday. Just so you're aware. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so when we look at the reactivity of our alkanes and alkenes, our alkanes are all sigma bonds. Okay. To form sigma bonds, our hybridization has to involve some type of s orbital. Okay. When we move to our double bonds with our alkenes, we now have a different type of bond. We've got a pi bond. That pi bond is higher in energy, more accessible for reactions, and hence that's what's going to be our reactive source when we're looking at our alkenes. Okay. So that's our source of electrons. If we've got electrons, we can have it act as a Bronsted base, Lewis base, nucleophile, all that kind of fun stuff. Okay. Um, where we ended off with, was look, or ended last week, was looking at the Bronsted bases. And I had this drawn up, and we stopped kind of in the middle. Okay? And I said, oh, cliffhanger, fun stuff. Okay? So what we went through and did, if we can draw, through, draw on our arrows in this case, is we started with the alkene and hydrobromic acid, or sorry, I think I got that right. Uh, and we said, okay, HBr is a strong acid. The hydrogen is less electronegative than the bromine, so the electrons spend most of their time on the bromine, so that hydrogen is very positive. So what we can do is share electrons from our alkene with the hydrogen. That hydrogen now has too many bonds, so we have to break a bond. The bond will break is between the hydrogen and the bromine. And what we've done is now a single step. Okay? Everything's got its oct or relatively has its octet satisfied. We can move on to our products. Because our electrons came from that double bond and not from an atom, it's kind of difficult to tell where exactly that hydrogen went. Okay? So if we look in the top case, that hydrogen, that new hydrogen, we could say, is this one right here. Finish that off. If we look at the bottom case, we could say our hydrogen is maybe this guy. Okay, so in one case, in our bottom case, our hydrogen attached to, hey, why not? We got colors, let's color them in. Attached to our green carbon. Okay, in the other case, our hydrogen went to the blue carbon. And the question becomes, well, if that's the case and we move on to our next step, are our products different? Okay, we don't even have to move to the products. We could look at these intermediates. Are these intermediates different? Can I take, flip, rotate, spin any of these structures, these two compounds in the middle, and get them to overlap each other? No. 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 So we definitely have different products already based on that simple step, or that very first step. Okay? Because of that, we have to evaluate the energies of those and try and decide, are they both the same energy, or are they different? And if they're different... I'm going to decide how different they are and then push that even further and say I'm not going to form the other one. Okay? It would be a minor product because it doesn't form in high enough amounts to actually be relevant. Okay? So let's look at the difference between these two. What is the difference? could say where the hydrogen was, but does that really tell us much about reactivity? A sigma bond? No. Could look at hybridization. I like that a little bit better. Hybridization where? Uh, of the CH3, of that bond, that carbon. I only s I see one CH3 here. Is this the CH3 one you want me to look at? Yeah. Is well, that hybridization change? Well, no, the carbon that that's attached to. Okay, so what we're looking at, say, in this case, hybridization there versus here. Yeah. Okay, I like the upper one. That one makes sense to me. Why might I like looking at that one as an important position to look at in that structure? What makes the structure unstable? It's the charge. 
we've got a charge on that structure, and it's at that position. So I could go through and try and classify that charge, come up with some way to describe it as best I could. Okay? How could I classify that? How do you know it's secondary? We'll evaluate the carbons attached to it. We've got one carbon over here, one carbon over here. We have a secondary carbocation on the top. If we move to the bottom structure, you said you wanted to look at the carbon immediately attached to um, that CH3. And so I've got the arrow pointing to that. Is that really going to be the best option to look at for that structure? Okay, is that the most reactive part of that structure? No. Where's the most reactive part? The positive charge. So what, that was supposed to be an eraser. So what we'll do is shift our focus to our cation. What kind of cation do we have there? We have a primary. Primary versus secondary. Which one's more stable? Secondary. What does that say about our lower reaction? Doesn't happen. that all together. Okay. Oh, come on. Okay, so now if we look at that top structure, we've got that carbocation. We said that's unstable. It's more stable than the other one, so, but at least it can form now because it's more stable. How can I ultimately fix that all together? Make it really stable. I need to make it neutral. What do I have to give that positive charge to make it neutral? Where do I have electrons? On the technically bromide, but you're correct. I can give the electrons from the brom bromide atom to our carbocation. We've now shared electrons and we've formed a bond, and what we end up with is our product. This would technically be our major product, which is the one that we would test on, or the ones that I would test on, and the other one would be our minor product. You would need to be able to explain why it's the minor product and why it should not be an answer. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes? I'm just lost as to where it goes from the intermediate with the, the cation mm -hmm. to that. Like, where does everything go? It seems like a lot of things disappear. You're right. A lot of things did disappear. Anything particularly relevant disappear, though. So let's go through and evaluate. I've got a CH3, right? So let's start with that. Uh, let's not start with that. I changed my mind. Nothing disappeared. The H is Yep. So we had our bromine come in to that carbon. So we've got our carbon with our bromine bond. How many bonds does that carbon have shown to it? So if we look right here in the product, how many bonds are shown? three bonds, so we've got the bromine, then we've got these two other lines coming off. We've got three bonds shown, which means there's a fourth bond to a hydrogen. Where's that hydrogen over here? There it is. Okay. What's at the end of those lines out here? It's a point. Every point is a carbon. How many bonds are shown to that carbon? Only one, which means a CH3. There's that one. Okay, So you will see this a lot. I intentionally left it off in this case trying to fish for someone to ask for that question. Why does it look like it changed? Nothing changed. Remember the simplifications that we go through. Carbons are points. Hydrogens are often implied. We will show hydrogens if we want to see what's happening with the chemistry. We're trying to look at the mechanism a little bit more carefully. Okay. You'll notice that when I drew out the hydrogens, even on the intermediates through this middle section here, I didn't draw the hydrogens around that methyl. Didn't add them on as extra positions like I did in the other cases, as extra bonds. Why not? Did it do anything? No. If it didn't do anything, why should I spend the time 
to draw out those extra bonds when I don't have to. Okay? So when you see these problems, realize that you can go through more complicated intermediates, complicated structures. You can simplify them to a final answer, or you can draw out a more complicated thing. They are the same thing. Just be aware of those differences. Okay? What we just discovered was that our most stable product is formed. We've seen that before a couple times. Okay? In fact, we've seen that with every reaction. We're always trying to form something more stable. Okay? So what we could go through and do is look at some more stability things. In the process of this reaction, we had a carbocation form. right? Okay? So we could go through and rank each of those. How could we name or classify each of these? How many carbons are attached to that first carbon? Zero. Zero. So we could call it zero area. Darn you and your methyl. Okay, the next one. We call it primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay, so let's see. I'm pretty sure I got it animated. Could add that extra information into it. Okay, what makes each of those species unstable? The charge. The charge. Okay. How can I make those more stable? I need to give them electrons. If we supply electrons from the outside, that's a secondary feature. We now can't rank those compounds based on their sheer stability. We're looking at how they interact with something else. Mm -hmm. So instead, what we've got to do is ignore the outside and look for electrons that can stabilize it <coughs> from within the structure. Where do we have electrons within the structure? We've got them in bonds, and you also find them in atoms. All of those have the same number of bonds. The only thing that's different is the atoms around them. All right, we've got hydrogens, which you can tell I've circled. And then we've also got carbons. What's the difference between hydrogen and carbon? The number of electrons. Okay. How many electrons does carbon bring in? How many electrons does hydrogen bring in? One. So we could go through and total these for each of these structures. Four, four, one. And we could add these all up. We'll end up with 12 electrons around our tertiary, nine electrons around our secondary, six around our primary, and three around our zero area. Which of those is going to be the most stable cation? Which of those is the least positive? The tertiary, because it has the most electrons around it to neutralize that positive charge. Okay? We can't draw resonance in any of these cases. All we're looking at is just the sheer amount of electrons around it. In the tertiary case, we've got a lot more electrons around it. So if we were going to predict stability, we would predict our tertiary would be the most stable, which is exactly what we said in that previous slide. Our secondary product was favored over our primary. Our secondary was a more stable cation. The other option, instead of looking at our intermediate, is we could have looked at the reactivity of our starting material. Okay, so if we go all the way back, see if I can get it back there. We had the electrons from that bond go out and attack the hydrogen. Ultimately, what we're actually saying here is not the bond attacking, because we can't have the bond really form another bond to something else. That's the space in between. Really what we're saying is we're drawing a resonance structure for this compound where we've put the electron density on one atom versus the other. Which of those two resonance structures is better? Okay, we just looked at the positive charge. Where should our positive charge sit? In the middle of the structure. There's more electrons around it. There's our more stable one. Okay, we focused on the positive charge. Is there another part of that that's reactive? Mm -hmm. The negative charge. So let's think about this now about the negative. So if we go and look at this negative, we said our boxed one, which is the one we've decided is our answer, gives us what kind of a negative charge? Primary, secondary, tertiary. Primary. What is the one that we've decided is not the correct answer? Secondary. Where do you think your anion is going to be more stable? Probably on the primary. I mean, that's the one that we've formed our product with. So let's go through and see what's happening with that. OK? 
Okay? So if we go through and again look at these, the electron count doesn't change around any of these. So we've still got, what is it, 3, 6, 9, and 12 electrons. Okay? What makes the anion unstable? The negative charge. How do we get a negative charge? Electrons. How can I make a negative charge more stable? I want to give it less electrons. Okay? Again, we could try and have it react with something positive, but we can't do that. And the only thing we're allowed to look at is really electrons. So we'll go through and evaluate hydrogen versus carbon. Our tertiary has 12 electrons around our anion. What does that mean about the effective negative charge? It goes really, really high. What does that mean about the reactivity? A lot more reactive. Which means which of the anions is more stable? Okay, our zero area or our methyl or our primary. Okay, so we end up seeing opposite patterns on that. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So a lot of these reactions, particularly when it comes to the mechanisms, is looking at the stability of each of the intermediates. Identify where you have something reactive. Look for that positive, look for that negative. See what happens with them. Okay. Because, of course, there was a person, one person to find this first, we have to refer to it by that. And what we're looking at is the Markovnikov addition. Okay, he also happened to be Russian. I think he's Russian. I can insult more Russians. Okay, so we're looking at the Markovnikov addition <laughs> in this case. Okay, our cation is going to form on our most substituted or our more stable position. Okay, it's been phrased slightly differently in other cases. Okay, the hydrogen adds to the side, and I never memorize it, so the hydrogen adds to the side of the double bond that already has the most hydrogens. Okay, which is the exact same thing that we just observed. It's just where our cation sits. So we looked at a slightly different frame of reference. Sorry, I don't want that quite yet. Um, I've heard a lot of professors refer to it as this. Um, if it helps you memorize, then it helps you memorize. The rich get richer where we look at hydrogens as wealth. Okay, so if you have a carbon with a lot of hydrogens, it's rich, which means if we go through an addition reaction, it's going to collect more hydrogens. That's looking at the Markovnikov addition. Okay, kind of makes sense? Okay, so the next thing, stereochemistry issues. Do we have any stereochemistry issues? If we take a look at our starting material, do we have any chiral carbons? Oh, crap. Yeah, we got a chiral carbon here. Okay. We look at our product. Do we have any chiral carbons? No. Okay. So chirality on its own may not be directly relevant, but could we add some more information to this? What's the relationship between the chlorine and the methyl group. Right idea. What structure do I have drawn in the middle here? What kind of ring? Cyclohexane. What can we do with cyclohexanes? We could look at chairs, and we could look at, say, our chlorine versus our methyl. Is the position that my chlorine in different from the position of my methyl? Yeah. Yes. Okay. How would I show that on my two-dimensional overhead drawing? Wedges and dashes. Okay. So when I go back and look at this starting material, or go back and look at these, actually I'd have to go all the way back to the starting material, I could apply a wedge, say, to that methyl. Does that wedge change when I add hydrogen? So in that first step, does anything happen to that wedge? So if we added mechanistic arrows, we'd start with our electrons. Did I do anything to the wedge? No. Nope, so it stays the same. Okay, what happens in that last step? Describe it first. Let's ignore the stereochemistry for the moment. Where does the chlorine attack? 
It's going to attack the positive charge. The positive charge is from what type of orbital? What's the hybridization of that carbon? SP2. How do I get a positive charge? I have an empty p orbital. That chloride, remember the shape of your p orbital, we got two lobes. That chloride can put its electrons into which lobe? Both. Which means what happens with our product? I could have the chlorine come in from, say, the top, which means the chlorine would be wedged. And our methyl would be dashed. What happens if, say, the chlorine had come in from the bottom? The chlorine would be dashed, and our methyl would be wedged. Okay? So while it's not strictly stereochemistry that we need to be concerned about, we do have to realize how the mechanism affects the possible products. And we go through the addition reaction, we form that carbocation, or at least these addition reactions. We form that carbocation. Because we have that carbocation, our nucleophile uh, can attack from either side of that carbon. And if wedges and dashes are something that are important or starting in our starting material, we're going to have to be aware that that is going to determine what our products are going to be. So if I had asked the question with just the lines, I would expect just the lines is the answer. If I had drawn it with the wedge, what would I expect as the answer? Wedges and dashes. So let's say you provided just this answer. Would you have been correct? No. You would have only been half correct. You have to provide both because both are formed in the reaction. Okay, does that make sense? And it, come, it comes back to that carbocation. So we can have, so let's see, do I have it better drawn on the next slide? Not at all better drawn on the next slide. What the heck? Wasn't it bromine? Guess not. So let's try and see if I can draw this transition state a little bit better. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take that structure and I'm going to turn it on its side. So right now what we're looking at, we're assuming all of those atoms are in the exact same plane. Okay, so let's draw it up here. So what I'm going to do is take this structure and kind of flip it up towards you. We've got the methyl, which will be dashed going away from you. And then we've got the CH2s, for that ring, would be wedged coming at you. Okay, So we've taken this structure, and literally all I'm doing is putting the methyl as a pivot point, and I'm rotating it upwards. And now I'm saying that carbon is the center of my drawing. This CH3 is now aimed away from you. So let's see if we can color that in so you can see that a little bit better. The ring structure, those CH2s are now coming out at you. So to draw those, I would have to specify with a wedge. Where's the P orbital in this structure? P orbital is coming in and out of the plane at you. So if I draw on that P orbital, it in in black, it would be right, very ugly drawn, in the middle. The chloride ion can either come in and attack from the top or from the bottom. Because both of those are options and the rest of the structure, as I had it drawn with the wedge out here, implies a difference between top and bottom, I end up with two possible products because that chloride can attack either from the top of that p orbital or from the bottom. 
giving me a slightly different answer. What if it wasn't wedged? That if there was no wedge, then there's no information for you to go on. You don't know if that methyl is up or down, which means you don't know where the chlorine attacked, either from the top or the bottom. So you wouldn't have to be concerned about it. The only time you'll be concerned is if that extra information is added. So the extra information is there, then you know just to do both options. You need both options. Yep. Okay. Does that make a little bit more sense? Okay. You can talk to me after class then. Okay. So we're going to start to move into now a lot more tricky stuff. As far as the rest of the semester goes, everybody hated question 23 on your last exam, which was ultimately, here's a reaction, give me the product. Here's another reaction, give me the product. Okay? Everybody says, oh, I hate memorization, hate memorization. Um, and that there's so much memorization in organic chemistry. And then you do great in all these classes that require it. Okay? This question, or these series of questions, are strictly 100% memorization. There's nothing else to them. You have to be aware of what those reagents do, what they react with, and you draw the product. I'm not asking for a mechanism, not asking for intermediates. You just have to be able to say what the answer is, what's the result. Okay? So there's a couple ways that we can go through and approach these. I personally like the method of identifying bonds um, or weak bonds. Okay, what would be a good weak bond to look for? Pi bonds are a good bond to look for. Okay, so since I've got a pi bond, and if we look at the initial substrate here, okay, the only thing that's reactive within that is the pi bond. So that pi bond's got to do something. So I'm going to red flag that. Okay, do I have another reactant? I have HCl. Okay, which don't necessarily treat it as a solvent, treat the solvent um, as something under the arrow. Okay, sometimes you'll see the solvent above the arrow, but even then, be careful calling something a solvent. Okay. Is the bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine weak? Yes, how do you know that? Electronegativity, good answer. The difference in electronegativity between those is huge, so I have another weak bond there. That's an eraser. So we could go through and say, okay, those are the bonds that I'm going to end up breaking in this process. I need to come up with some way to predict what's going to happen here. So I can evaluate those bonds a little bit closer. When you look at HCl, you said, yes, it's a weak bond because of the difference in electronegativity. Can you give me more information about that? Chlorine is likely going to be negative because more electronegative. What happens to the hydrogen? Okay. What happens with our pi bond? So we get an equal sharing between those two carbons. So that's not very helpful. Okay. So let's push it further based on the information we just learned. Okay. Let's try a resonance structure where I'm going to push the electrons in that bond to one carbon versus the other. Okay. What ends up happening if I push the electrons according to my blue arrow? All the electrons move on to this carbon, right? Which means what charge does it become? What happens to the other carbon? If we looked at the red arrow, what happens? We get the opposite result. Which of those results is better? What's that? Red or blue? Red. Why red? Uh, give me a little bit more than that. Our more stable carbocation is on the tertiary carbon. Markovnikov's rule. Which means I can ignore the negative and positive in blue. So if I now need to go through and predict my product in this case, did I do anything to that bond that I'm drawing in black so you can't tell? Let me try that again. Did I do anything to any of the sigma bonds through this structure? No, which means what's the very first thing I should draw on the product? The sigma bond skeleton. 
Okay. If I've got a positive charge, how can I stabilize it? Give it a negative charge. So let's look at the positive charge on my carbocation. Okay, how can I stabilize that? I need a negative charge. Where do I have a negative charge? I've got a negative charge on my carbon. How can I stabilize that? Where do I have a positive charge? On the hydrogen. So I could draw a hydrogen on there. What's your answer? That. No mechanism. You found the positive, you found the negative, you put them together. That's it. So then the next question is, should we put the hydrogen there? What's one of our simplifications? You do not need to show it. If you showed it, I don't personally take off points for that. Um, if you have to take more advanced organic chemistry, other professors do take off points for that, and online systems absolutely take off points for that. If you specify any hydrogen on a carbon atom, you have to specify every other hydrogen. I don't know why. It's dumb. Okay? But that's the official rule. Okay? Yes? I'm just confused slightly as to why you put the... Uh that pi bond where you did and not like the reverse way, like the blue one. So it came down to the stability of those two. So we tried to evaluate the reactivity there and there's two ways that we could look at it. Which do you prefer to look at? Positive charge or negative charge? Positive. Okay, look at the positive charge in the blue case. How can you classify that carbon? This is secondary. Look at it in the red case, what is it? Which is more stable? Tertiary. Which one's going to be the favored color? Red. So we would ignore the blue resonance, which is why I erased it. And that's why we can say that's not our reactive position. Does that make sense? <laughs> the other option is looking at the negative. Okay? And some of that comes from looking at the intermediates and knowing the rules. You have to know the stabilities of those. So let's say instead of looking at the positives, we looked at the negatives. Okay, if we look at the blue, where's the negative charge? On the tertiary. Tertiary. If we look at the red, where's the negative charge? Where's our negative charge most stable? On the secondary. On the secondary. Which means, if I'm given the option between those two resonance structures, which one is the favored resonance structure? The one in red. Because that puts my positive charge in the most stable position. It puts my negative charge in the most stable position. There's my reactive species. Got it? Okay. We've got a bunch of examples to go through, so if you're still having questions, we'll see what happens. So let's move to the next one. Now I'm not quite as nice. Why am I not quite as nice? All sorts of fun answers on this. <laughs> yeah, I've got about half an hour of it recorded. Sorry. We start with red bromine. When we add that bromine to the alkene, do we have that bromine-bromine bond anymore? Nope. So the solution goes colorless. So it's a nice, quick, easy test to classify for alkenes. If there's an alkene present, the bromine reacts with it nearly instantly, neutralizes the bromine's presence, and we don't see that color anymore. So then the question is, how does this reaction work? All right? So just like we've done with everything else, we want to find positives and negatives. See any obvious positives and negatives? So we could play around with the double bond. Where would we push the electrons on our double bond? Oh, actually, so I made it easier than I intended. We could push the electrons either direction with really no harm whatsoever. And when we look at our product, is it going to matter? We're putting the exact same thing on either end, so it's really kind of irrelevant. Okay, so we don't have to stress about that. But what we could go through and do is say, okay, fine, if it doesn't matter... Let's pick one. Which one do you want to be positive? Which one do you want to be negative? You said it doesn't matter, so... 
red one on top. I'm not quite sure what that meant, but sure. okay. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So that's, that's exactly what I meant. So we've got okay, our reactive negative charged alkene and the positive end. Remember, our double bond is our source of electrons. So as far as our mechanism goes, the electrons are going to come from that bond or ultimately from that atom and come out. Okay, so we're not looking at bromine coming into the positive. We have to look at the electrons actively moving. Where do they have to move to? They have to move to bromine to form a bond between them. How many bonds can bromine have? One. Or it's really only happy with one. I'm going to regret having said that and recorded this. The next step. So what ends up happening is that bond ends up breaking and we get this funky looking structure. Okay, which I'm going to immediately put in brackets. And, yeah, thank you. We've got Br negative floating around. We've got a positively charged intermediate. And I've got it shown as a transition state because this species doesn't actually form. What's special about bromine? Go through and list everything off you got. Halogen. It's a halogen. It's big. Big was all I wanted, so we can stop right there. It's really, really big, which means that electron cloud is very large, right? Which means that bromine, if we were going to look at its electron density, is probably something along these lines, sort of. Why is that relevant? Is there something nearby, and it comes to steric hindrance, that those electrons could help stabilize? That positive charge is really, really close. And so what we end up finding is an odd intermediate. Okay, a very interesting looking one. That it looks something along these lines. We have what's referred to as the bromonium ion. Happens with chlorines as well. Okay? That bromine is so large that it coordinates to the positive charge as well. Why is this going to be important? Well, it's now going to block one side of that cation. So if we looked at that cation, remember it's a p orbital. We could say our bromine or bromide ion comes in from the top or from the bottom. Except we don't have that cation anymore. We have the bromonium ion. Okay? So our carbocation, while still being our reactive position, even though the bromine's positive, one side of that carbon is no longer available to react, which means our bromide ion has to come in from the back side. Okay? Which means what about our product? We get a trans alignment of our product. Okay? If we were going to look at how we would refer to this reaction, we could also refer to it as a uh, all right, anti-addition. I think that's right. We can get an anti-addition product. Okay? The bromine atoms are added on opposite sides of the double bond, okay? as far away from each other as they can be. Okay. In this case, is it particularly relevant? What can we do about a single bond? We can freely rotate. It doesn't become quite as obvious as to its importance. So let's try another example. Okay. The size of our halogens when we're going through these types of reactions, bromine and chlorine in particular, okay, they're highly polarizable which allows them to interact with the double bond to a much larger extent than, say, smaller diatomic atoms. Okay? And they also stabilize that cation intermediate. So if we want to add our arrows again to this reaction, 
okay, to kind of show what's happening. We've got our double bond attacking. The electrons go to our bromide. We form the bromonium ion, which we just talked about. If we take that structure and turn it, so in this case, I'm going to grab that lower carbon and I'm going to flip it up towards you. Okay? So the idea being to see what's happening with the groups around it. The bromine atom, our bromonium ion, is above the plane of the cyclopentane ring. The hydrogens are below. So if we're now going to look at our bromide ion's ability to come in and try and completely stabilize the structure. So it, let's say this is going to be our reactive carbon. Can our bromide come in from the top just as easily as from the bottom? No. The top becomes inactive and we get the bromine coming in from the bottom. Why? What's the difference between the top and the bottom? We've got bromine on the top with a bunch of electrons. What's on the bottom? There's something on the bottom always. Hydrogen. Which one's going to block better? The bromine. Which is why our bromide will attack from the bottom. Even though it is still sterically blocked a little bit, it's not enough by that hydrogen. Okay? Which ends up resulting in our anti-addition so if we looked at our cyclohexene, we end up with wedges and dashes in our final product. Okay. Officially, if we're going to refer to this reaction uh, as a broader term, both bromine and chlorine, we'd be looking at the holonium ion forming in the intermediate. If we're going to look at bromine, it would be the bromonium, chlorine, the chloronium. Okay. So we're looking at the anti-addition or a trans product. Does that make sense? Okay, this is a fun slide. Yep, really fun slide. So let's go through and kind of draw some stuff to get you an idea of what's happening here. Okay, what we're looking at is the reaction of an alkene with hydrogen. So I'm going to draw out. Oh, this is going to be ugly. I'm going to draw out an alkene here. What we're going to do is react this with H2 or HL, whichever you prefer, as long as it's the two. What might you predict to be the product? Have we seen maybe a similar reaction? just looked at. Bromine, diatomic molecule. Hydrogen, diatomic molecule. What do you think is going to happen in this reaction? What's trans? What's the things being added to our double bond? We're going to add hydrogens. And not a bad idea to say possibly trans. So let's go ahead and highlight those new hydrogens. So we know that those are the new ones. Okay, so just based on what we've seen already, that sounds reasonable. Okay, we've got a couple problems with this. Number one, one of the reasons we said that bromine and chlorine could react with the double bond was because why? They were large. Lots and lots of electrons, extremely polarizable. Is hydrogen large? No. no. So is this going to be an easy reaction for hydrogen to do? No. Okay? To facilitate this reaction, what we have to do is add a catalyst. Okay? It requires a catalyst. Catalyst. Yes? Close enough. Okay? The catalysts that are most common, you'll see palladium, platinum, you'll even see nickel thrown in there as well. Okay? Of these, the ones that I'll probably test you on or that you'll see on your exams would be your palladium and platinum. Okay? Both of those materials are expensive. Um, and what's their phase? Solid. So we've got what could potentially be gas in our hydrogen and our alkene, hopefully a liquid. We're looking at a heterogeneous system. Lots of different things in different phases interacting. We need to try and facilitate that interaction as best as possible so what are we going to do to our solid? We're 
We're going to pulverize it as much as we can. We don't quite want to melt it. Any ideas why? What temperature do you think you've got to get palladium and platinum up to before they melt? High. Pretty high. What's the problem with hydrogen? It's kind of flammable. So heating up your reaction is not going to be the best option um, to get palladium or platinum into the liquids phase. Okay. So what we're going to end up doing instead is pulverizing them and putting them onto a solid substrate. So you'll almost always see them in conjugation with a C. Any ideas what C stands for? Crush. Carbon. <laughs> carbon, what we're going to do is pulverize the platinum and have it embedded in a carbon substrate. That carbon substrate maximizes surface area and helps this reaction occur. Okay. The next thing that we mentioned was looking at how the hydrogens are added. And we suggested trans as the possibility. How did we decide that the bromine was added trans? Why did we get steric hindrance? Size. The size of the bromine allowed it to share with the cation to form that three-membered ring so that our bromide had to come in from the backside. Is hydrogen big enough to do that coordination? No. Okay. The other thing that we could look at to help us with this is to realize that we need to look at a mechanism. Okay. I'm not going to expect you to be fully responsible for the mechanism, particularly because I'm not going to draw it very well. And I'm going to try and get a figure up so you guys can look at it later so you can see it a little bit better. So here's the attempt. We're going to start with step one, your solid substrate. This is, yes, going to be bad. Please forgive me. Okay, so we've got our solid substrate. Hydrogen's going to coordinate to it. So we'll put a hydrogen now sitting on this that is now dotted. So it's interacting with our so solid su surface. Yeah, one of those. Okay. Our alkene is also going to come along, and the extended pi system, or the pi system of our alkene, can now also interact with our surface. Those two molecules will float around on the surface until eventually they get close enough to each other, and the platinum facilitates the electron transfer. And so what ends up happening is we get a hydrogen shifting over to the carbon which then puts all the electrons into the bond with the platinum. So if we draw this intermediate out, I'm going to have to draw this as big as I can. We've now got a lonely hydrogen. Our carbon no longer has a, a coordination to the platinum surface because it no longer has that p orbital. Okay, So that carbon is now up away from the surface. That carbon is sp3 hybridized. So we've got our hydrogen down, and then we've got our other hydrogens aimed upwards. That hydrogen's right on that line. Okay. Is that other free hydrogen still interacting? This free hydrogen is now highly unstable. Oh, I see what you're saying. Interacting with the platinum surface, yes. Highly, highly unstable. So it needs to stabilize as fast as it can. What's close by? The other carbon, which also happens to be highly unstable. The hydrogen shifts over to our carbon, and what we end up generating is our product. If we go through and try and color code our hydrogens onto this. The new hydrogens are added like this. How were they added to our double bond? Where are they with relationship to the rest of the structure? They were added to the same side of the double bond, which would mean the not trans product. They're added on the cis, or there's, you end up with the cis product. If we're going to refer to it by the addition name, we end up calling it a sin addition. Okay? The best I can tell, sin is like an adverb, cis is the adjective. So they're just describing different 
parts of the reaction. Okay, so be aware of that when you add hydrogen, um, based on all of the stuff that you guys will see this semester, you're adding it uh, in a syn type addition. Those hydrogens are, end up in your product cis. Okay, questions about that? Okay, so we'll end there. Um, we will be finishing all of the alkene chemistry on Thursday. Um, I would recommend that you go through and work 